Welcome to Cleveland Classic Cinema. Tonight's movie is 1954's Devil Girl from Mars, directed by David McDonald. We saw this with our own eyes. An object the like of which we had never seen before. A frightening, strange shape descending from outer space with relentless purpose. Where did it come from? And what did it want of us? Hello, hello, hello. It's an aircraft all right, but like nothing I've ever seen before. Hello. What do you mean? Hello, hello. It's like something from another planet. So, do not try to follow me. You cannot get help. Around this house, I've drawn an invisible wall through which no one may pass. Here is a news reporter with a world-shattering story. A girl trying to escape from her past. The scientist trapped in spite of his knowledge. Here also is the barmaid, hiding a murderer's secret. A murderer with a life already forfeit. And introducing the devil girl from Mars herself. Get back on fire. You fool. Get back! Shoot, man, shoot! Before I start, let me completely distance myself from responsibility for showing this movie. I'm sure the more observant of you have noticed that in the course of the intros I do, there's a lower third, like this one down here, telling you what you're watching and who I am, that dissolves in and out occasionally, saying that if you have questions or comments, write to me at clevelandclassics at hotmail.com. I put that there because I enjoy hearing from viewers, and a few of you have noticed and written to me. I'm always very happy to see that I've got mail that's not from the Windows Hotmail Live team telling me how much more disk space I have to store the messages I haven't gotten yet. I would say that 99.8% of the messages I receive at that account are from viewers who really enjoy the show. And it's such a great thing to see. You know, every so often it's nice to know your work is appreciated and I answer every, you know, every message I get. When I do, I usually ask the viewer if there are any movies that I could show that they'd like to see. Tonight's movie was requested by a viewer. Since he apparently doesn't have a computer, he passed the message on to his cousin, who let me know via email. Never let it be said that I don't bow to the requests of my viewers, so Trish, this one's for your cousin. And for you, if you want it. This movie is not one that I ever considered putting on the show. In fact, it never even registered on my radar. Until I went out and got this, I'd never seen it. Of course, I'd heard of it, that, you know, a, title like Devil Girl for Mars is pretty hard to ignore after all, and like any other red-blooded hetero male, the thought of being kidnapped and taken to an entire planet full of beautiful women for breeding purposes has crossed my mind more than once, more often than not during math class in grade school and then just before being called to the board to do a problem. The way I always pictured it and the way this movie portrays it, however, are two completely different things. Before I start this, let me remind all the female viewers out there that this is a guy thing, okay? First of all, I always felt that since Mars has a lighter gravitational pull, the women from there would probably be built really well since being, shall we say, top heavy, wouldn't be that much of a problem. They'd also be a lot, you know, like be a lot taller, like uh, an average of six foot four, and they dress in really revealing outfits because they live on Mars. I don't know what that has to do with you know, how they dress really, but we're blue skying here, so anything goes. Lastly, they'd all be wearing like four or five inch spike heeled shoes because I like women in spike heeled shoes. You know, it occurs to me that I'm imparting a little too much information here, so let's get back to the movie. Devil Girl from Mars is, according to my research, based on a stage play, which I think explains why it looks as stagey as it does. 
the camera never strays too far from the set for the entire film, and it's tuck, 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 all the way through, even after Naya the Devil Girl shows up. One of the first reviews of this movie I read spelled her name N-Y-A-H-H, -H, so I thought her name was Nya. That made me think that maybe this wasn't such a bad film. I mean, if you have a villain that's named Nya, there's got to be some camp value to be had here. Imagine my surprise when I discovered there was none. I will say this for Naya, though. She does wear that outfit pretty well. And although I couldn't have done without the Magneto helmet and the combat boots she wears through the whole film. At the very least, the barmaid isn't bad, even if she is a bit horse-faced. You know, that reminds me of something that really bugs me. I worked as a bartender for more years than I'd care to admit. Believe it or not, there aren't many paying positions for experienced crew people around Cleveland. And in every movie or TV show I've ever seen, the bartenders are always seen drying glasses with a towel. You never dry glasses with a towel. <sighs> See, behind the bar there are three sinks. Wash, which is filled with soapy water and an upright scrub brush. Rinse, which is filled with hot, clean water. And sanitize, which is filled with hot water. You throw these little blue tablets into that dissolve and make the water into some kind of sanitizing bath. You scrub the glasses, dip them in the rinse, dip them in the sanitizer, and then you set them upside down and let them drain dry. You never dry them with a towel, especially the inside, because that contaminates them with whatever's on the towel. But it seems that's an accepted bit of uh, business for bartenders and movies, along with never getting paid for the drinks they serve. As long as I'm on the subject of bars and bartending, I feel compelled to point out that this film was made when being an alcoholic was funny. The husband dives behind the bar for a scotch every chance he gets, and if anything untoward happens, the answer is they have a shot. The little boy got nabbed by Naya, but I got the scotch. We're all going to get killed by Naya? Pass the brandy. There's a killer robot outside that can disintegrate anything? Ooh, I need a grasshopper. Speaking of which, let's talk a bit about Chani the Robot. I always feel bad for movies that have to feature a robot, especially ones like this. The effects budget for movies of this sort are usually the lowest parts of the budget, so the poor effects guys have to scrimp and make things look, you know, threatening. They didn't quite make it this time. Chinese the Killer Robot looks like a Kelvinator with a gumball machine for a head. Now that I think about it, he may be a distant relative of Tom Servo. Naya does have some pretty impressive technology at her command to Kelvinator the Robot notwithstanding. She has a ship made of organic metal that repairs itself, a never-ending supply of energy thanks to the perpetual motion aspects of her atomic generator, could put up an impenetrable force field around anything she wants, and can hypnotize humans just by bugging her eyes out a little bit. It turns out that the reason she needs to rate Earth for breeding stock is because there was a war between the females and the males on Mars, and the females won. I think the men probably gave up because they ran out of clean clothes. Now all the men are either apparently dead or impotent, so Naya came to Earth landing in Scotland because of damage to her ship. She should have landed in the warehouse district because I guarantee she'd have been stampeded the second she announced what she was there for. For some reason, the hero in this is an American. Everyone else is British or Scottish, but I guess the producers felt they needed to have an American in order to sell this across the pond. They could have skipped the entire American reporter idea if they just had to, you know, made the film halfway entertaining. There is, like, no action in this movie whatsoever. The only fight that takes place is about as rough as the one between Corey and Naomi and From Hell It Came, and a lot less entertaining. The whole thing is like a badly cliched melodrama filled with sappy dialogue and characters you wouldn't spit on if they were on fire. The one good thing that happens in this movie is when Naya disintegrates the ever-present creepy handyman. His glasses are the only thing left of him, but when she disintegrates a car, later the whole thing disappears. Well, you know, whatever. This is going to be another Baron Bios intro. For example, let me quote the biography of Hugh McDermott, the actor who plays Michael, the American reporter. This is the entire entry for him in the Probert Encyclopedia of Actors, which I probably won't be referring to much if I need anything other than birth dates. Quote, Hugh McDermott was an actor. He was born in 1908 and died in 1972. Unquote. What can I possibly add to that? Kind of makes you wish you knew him, didn't it? Well, I can add that he was born on March 23, 1908 in Edinburgh, Scotland, appeared in 57 movies and TV shows over the course of his career, and died on January 29, 1972 in London, England. I had better luck with this one. Hazel Court was born on February 10, 1926 in Sutton Coldfield, Birmingham, England. 
She appeared in 70 films and TV shows over the course of her career, starting with an uncredited bit part in 1944's Champagne Charlie. She was still a teenager when she was discovered appearing on stage by agents working for the J. Arthur Rank organization and quickly worked her way up to speaking roles during the late 1940s. True popularity came when she appeared in the role of Elizabeth in 1957's The Curse of Frankenstein. She moved to Hollywood in, early, in the early 60s and appeared in five Roger Corman movies, including 1963's The Raven and 1964's Mask of the Red Death. Her last role was in 1981's The Omen, The Final Conflict. Hazel Court died of a heart attack on April 15, 2008 in Lake Tahoe, California. Adrienne Corey was born Adrienne Riccoboni on November 13, 1931 in Edinburgh, Scotland. Educated at the Royal Academy of the Dramatic Arts in London, she appeared in 88 films and TV shows during her career, making her film debut in 1949's The Romantic Age. She appeared as rape murder victim Mrs. Alexander in 1971's A Clockwork Orange, directed by Stanley Kubrick. She had a feud with Kubrick after shooting her scenes for that film, as she had to be completely nude during it, and Kubrick, as he often did, shot dozens of takes for the complicated scene. It was years before she would speak to him again. An expert on 18th century portrait painting, she authored the 1985 book The Search for Gainsborough. She currently lives somewhere on Earth. Devil Girl from Mars was a bit of a disappointment to me, to tell you the truth. Granted, I wasn't expecting much, but I was expecting a bit more than I got, which was pretty much an English drawing room drama. As memory serves, it was marginally better than uh, Queen of Outer Space, but that's like describing a pain as hurting less than a root canal without Novocaine. Actually, as amazed as I am these days at the crap that gets a green light, movies like this don't really faze me. At the time this was made, the movie studios were a lot like factories grinding out movies to pretty much just keep product on the screens. The amount of movies cranked out by the various studios, both large and small, established and independent during the 40 years or so before tonight's movie was released is stunning. I would confidently state that they probably number close to 100,000, if not more. What's even more amazing is that of all these movies, the ones that make up the very dregs are the ones we broadcast on this show. Actually, I seriously overstate the case. We do show good movies every once in a while maybe twice a year. However, just as I believe in rewarding our faithful viewers with a good movie every once in a while, I wouldn't want to foster unrealistic feelings of anticipation either. And if I screwed up and caused said feelings to spring up in any of you, rest assured tonight's movies will completely wipe them out. It's the least I could do. So right now, sit back, relax, and enjoy Devil Girl from Mars, right here on Cleveland Classic Cinema.